movie fans, my name is Mike Boss, writer and director of Anonymous 616, which is a psychological thriller slash horror film, which we produced for an astounding little budget of 27,000. Now we already got great reviews from some independent movie critics, and I would assume that most of the people have understood the movie, but I do come across comments and discussions on the internet of people who did not understand the movie and they would like to have an explanation and so on. So today I'm making this video in order to explain the film Anonymous 616. And if you haven't seen the movie yet, you should watch the movie first. You can watch it uh, for free on Amazon Prime and it's also on Google Play and soon on iTunes. So watch the movie and if you do not understand it, you can come back to this video. But for everybody else, stay tuned for the explanation, but um, a spoiler alert has been given. Alright, in this video I will explain the three questions that came up the most. First, who is Anonymous 616? Is it the devil? Is it God? Or is it the pastor? Second question, what is real and what is not real? Like, is the chat room real? Is the pastor in the end real? Is the police real? All right. Third question, who is Pastor Warned and what's, what does the ending mean? All right. And in the end, I will explain the message of the film, the way I wrote it and the way I see it. But before we get there, let me lead you up to the moment where things start getting awry. So if you remember correctly, Jason and Jenna are visiting Eric and Monica. Jason and Eric are best friends, but they haven't seen each other for about two years because Jason is in the military and serves overseas in Iraq. So they reunite and have some champagne to celebrate. Jason talks about his war experience and that's where we realize the first time that Jason might be a little off. Because not only does he claim that PTSD doesn't affect him at all, but he also nonchalantly tells a horrific war story. After that, Eric goes on to talk about his new job as a real estate agent and how he met his beautiful fiancée, Monica. Then they all have dinner where Emily gets introduced. Emily is the 12-year-old daughter of Monica. And there again, we notice that there's something evil lurking in Jason as he eyeballs the little girl from head to toe. Later, the adults smoke some weed while Emily is in her room and watching a movie. So they talk about different ideologies and what's important in life. But shortly thereafter, they all decide to, to smoke some DMT. And that's where everything starts to go awry. So you might remember that everybody had a good trip, except Jason. It was amazing. I wasn't even myself anymore. I was just this like vibrating mass of light that got rid of everything bad in me. Negativity just left me. So everybody talks about that negativity left them. And in the movie that is portrayed with the black smoke that ultimately attacks Jason and makes him wake up with a gasp. <laughs> so Jason's seed of evil that he already carries in him just got company by the negative black smoke and that's when he goes to throw up. Now it becomes even more evident that there's something wrong with Jason. After he spies on Emily, Jason gets alerted by a computer chime and notices that someone is calling him by his name. Now that would be pretty creepy for anybody. I mean, it's not even his house and someone is writing to him. That would probably make anyone curious and anxious. But it gets worse, because this anonymous person online not only claims, but also proves that he or she indeed knows everything about Jason. And that brings us to our first question. Now there are several different hints in the film, especially when Jason asks the computer, who is this? everything about you. Now, later on, Jason gets a phone call from Kelly, the preacher's daughter, and he asks her, 
Who knows everything about me? Who knows everything about me? Google. What? <laughs> I'm kidding. Only God knows everything about you. And yourself, of course. So Kelly says, only God knows everything about you. And yourself, of course. And if you remember, Jason even asks about the devil. And what about the devil? Does he know my thoughts, too? No, as far as I know, the scripture doesn't say Satan or his demons can read your mind or thoughts. So he cannot be the devil. And I think it's safe to assume it's also not God, because God would not push Jason to kill all those people, right? So who's left? Only Jason himself. I'm just like you. So the answer to the first question is, Anonymous 616 is no one else but Jason himself. Okay, is the chat room real? There are two huge hints in the film that should make this clear, especially when Jason later on learns that the computer was not even plugged in. Now we also understand Emily's reaction when Jason said, oh, I'm just chatting with some friends. Um, what are you doing? Nothing. I'm just chatting online with a friend of mine. You're funny. Why did she say that? You funny? Because in the flashback it is revealed that the computer screen was not even on. It was completely dark. So the answer is the chat room is not real. It's all in Jason's head. Now, is the past real? Well, we know that he gets shot in the end and nothing happens to him. So that's a pretty big indication that the pastor is not real. And the pastor also seems to know everything about Jason and later morphs into different people. So no, the pastor is not real. It's a figment of Jason's imagination. Don't you see the police car? All the cops? And all the weapons that are pointed at you? Is the police in the end real? A lot of people had a problem with that and couldn't really figure it out, although I think it's actually pretty obvious because when Emily walks away in the end, she walks over the driveway and there is no police. So the police is not there. But of course, Jason saw the police because the idea was put into his head by past warned, which makes him more powerful than Jason. Which brings me to the last question. Okay, so we already know that Pastor Warned isn't real. But who is he? Because Jason sees him and he is influenced by him. But I think it becomes pretty obvious when Pastor Warned starts morphing into all the different characters that Jason has killed. First we see Monica, then Eric, then Abdul Jabbar, then Jenna, and at the end we see Emily. In other words, Past the Warren is a manifestation of all the good spirits that came together. So it's definitely a battle between good and evil. And the good spirits are stronger than Jason's evil spirit. And that's why they can influence him and push him to commit suicide. And when Emily walks away, she fades to become a spirit again. Okay, there are a few messages and intentions in the movie, like when they ask, what is your ideology? And what is the most important thing to you on this planet? And I think it's important that every person asks themselves that question because it forces you to think, and that's how we gain wisdom. Speaking of ideologies, what's your guys' ideology? Like, what's the most important thing on the planet to you? But the main message has to do with the feeling-based society we're living in right now. Be brave enough to follow your heart. Really? And your feelings because they know what you really want. Because the feeling-based generation right now, the millennials and others, they really think 
that the most important thing on this planet is how they personally feel about things. And I like to challenge that with this film because I would claim that nobody really cares how you feel or how I feel. I mean, maybe your mother and your therapist, okay, but everybody on this planet cares about how you act. And that's the important thing. I mean, Jason makes it pretty clear in the movie, if you follow your impulses, if you follow your heart, if you follow your feelings, where this ultimately can lead. So the message is, think a little bit more and don't just act out of, with your feelings. You gotta follow your true inner feelings. <laughs> I mean, this feeling-based society has gone crazy, you know? I mean, give every kid a participation trophy so one kid maybe doesn't feel bad for losing? I mean, come on, grow up, get real. Everybody has to deal with that. Or the teachers, don't use red ink when you correct an essay because the color red is very aggressive and some kids might feel scared by this or offended. Or don't say this or don't say that because people might feel offended, you know? I mean, it's just crazy, you know? Let me tell you something. Narcissists are governed by their feelings and decent people are governed by the values they put above their feelings, okay? And I think we make it pretty clear throughout the movie what kind of values that we are cherishing. Maybe it's a combination of all those things, but first you need to have life before you can have anything. And that life needs to be free. Then it can pursue happiness. Right, right, like life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That sounds familiar, right? Bingo. Declaration of Independence, a very clever document. <clears throat> life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The US is the only country on this entire planet who has those three. And furthermore, I'm a big believer of the American Trinity. You told me yourself that it was about the American Trinity. Don't you remember? I sure do. E pluribus unum. Liberty, 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 and uh, liberty, and uh, You don't remember? Yeah, I do. I, I, it, um, How could you forget? <laughs> it's all over our currency. It is. Oh, fuck, you know what? You sure are. You're right. You're right. When you're right, you're right. There it is. E pluribus unum, out of many one, liberty, and in God we trust. So here's what God says. Jeremiah 17, 9. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Well, hold on a sec. Let me see that. Does that really say that? All right. Thanks for watching. Feel free to subscribe and watch the movie again or recommend the movie to your friends. Join us on Facebook, leave a great comment on Amazon and I see you soon.